Oh, good morning, everybody. Certainly good to see you and have you all here this morning on this glorious day of worship and to be able to engage in a wonderful encounter with the Holy Lord God on this very auspicious day in the life of the church as we recognize this as World Communion Sunday. And uh, let us now prepare our hearts and minds for a rich encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ with the words of the call to worship. Please stand and join me as we say these words from the bulletin uh, taken from Psalm 71. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me and I will still claim your deeds. Even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to the next generation. God of 
wonders beyond the galaxy. You are holy. And indeed, God is holy and other, the creator of the universe. And so when we sit there and we think of God's marvelous, and then we think of ourselves, we realize, oh man, I haven't lived as I should. I haven't lived in a way that my creator would be maybe happy with me. I've done things that I shouldn't have done, or maybe I haven't done some of those things that I should have done. And so as we come to this time of prayer of confession, the good news for us is that this creator of the universe is also a loving father who offers us grace and forgiveness. And so it's with that knowledge that we come and we boldly confess our sins, knowing that we're offered grace and mercy. So join me first in our unison prayer and then silently. Lord God of merciful grace, we come to you with our hearts and hands open to you. We know that we have woefully trusted in things that are temporal. Our identity has oftentimes been enmeshed with our pedigree and training. Our competence has been misdirected as it has been placed in things that rust, mold, and fade away. Forgive us, Lord, for elevating things destined for the garbage heap above you and not counting them for what they are in reference to who you are. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for you. Christ rose for you, Christ reigns in power for you, and Christ prays for you. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. My friends, be at peace and know that you are forgiven. You may be seated. All right, boys and girls... You're just going to stay where you are. But boys and girls, I want to make sure you're awake. So if you can hear me, clap your hands one time. If you can hear me, clap your hands two times. Awesome. Thank you. So this week, I was doing some cleaning in my basement. And I was going through, I had this bin of like treasures, you know. I'm sure, do you have any bins of treasures at your house where you collect things that are, you know, you think are really important? And so I thought it might be fun for me to just share. These are the things that I thought were worthy of being put in my treasure bin. So, first thing, I have a Roy Rogers Buckaroo Club card that I got when I was three years old. Now, I have no idea why I thought this belonged in my treasure bin, but it was in my treasure bin. Good through um, 1985 for a free cup of Coke or other soft drink with the purchase of a meal. So that was in my treasure bin. Interesting the things we think are important, right? Okay, now, oh, the next thing in my treasure bin. This actually was pretty special to me. It was my speech graduation certificate. So I spent two years in speech therapy because I couldn't say my S's, my CH's, my SH's. My speech teacher's name was Mrs. Russo. That was a mouthful. You know, even saying speech teacher, that was really hard. And so in 1981, I graduated from speech and I saved my certificate. Then I found, I found a bunch of report cards, which I was like, why did I save these? I don't know. I have fourth grade report cards, fifth grade report cards, sixth grade report cards. Now, I promise you in my adult life, no one has ever asked me, what did you get in fourth grade in math? Nobody has ever asked me that. But I thought it was super important and I saved it in my treasure box. And then, any girls out there working on, yeah? Any grown-ups? have you saved these? So I saved my Girl Scout sash at the time, and I worked, I worked really hard on this. I learned how to change the oil of my dad's car to get one of these badges. Like I learned how to do laundry. I learned all kinds of stuff. 
And I thought, okay, that makes it worthy of putting in my treasure bin. But once again, I promise you that in my adult life, nobody has said to me, uh, Karen, how many badges did you earn when you were a junior scout? Nobody has asked me. Nobody has asked me about my buckaroo card. Nobody has asked me about my speech therapy certificate. And so I, I was thinking, I was like, it's interesting the things that we think are important at the time. And, and while these things were all significant in my life, you know, as my life has changed, what's important has changed too. So when I looked at my bin of high school stuff, the things I saved from high school were different. I looked at my bin of college stuff, the things I saved from college were different. At different stages in my life, what I thought was important was different. But then I thought, okay, so, but what, what's been the constant through it all? What's been the most important thing? Because all these other things change. And then I realized, so what's been the constant through it all is Jesus. And, and whether, you know, grades, they come and go, badges come and go, different activities I was in come and go, those things change. What's important, all those kinds of things have changed over my life. But following Jesus, that's been the most important, most significant, most life-changing thing that has stayed constant throughout my whole life. And it reminded me, in a little bit, we'll read this entire passage, but I just wanted to read a little part of it for you right now um, from Philippians chapter 3. We're just going to look at verses 7 and 8. And it says, I thought things... I thought things like that were really something great. So like all those things that I showed you, I thought all those things were really something great. But now I consider them nothing because of Christ. Even more, I consider everything to be nothing compared to knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. To know him is worth much more than anything else. And so as, as we go through this week, I want us to think about the fact that Jesus is our all. Jesus is the best. Jesus is our joy. He's the one who makes a way for us to be right with God. And that's the most, most important thing. Other things, they come and go. But our relationship with Jesus, that's something to treasure forever. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that that you are with us always, that you don't change, that you are always, um, you always love us, you always care for us, and we pray that you would help us to always love you and to always hold you as most important as other things come and go, Lord. Help us to keep our focus on you and to remember that you are the best and you are the all in all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to be looking at an Old Testament lesson from the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 34, verses 1 through 7. And as I see a bunch of kids out there, I want you to realize the story you're going to hear is about this guy who becomes king when he is 8 years old. So if you're older than eight, think you'd already be that king or queen in this story. Listen now to God's word as it's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 1 through 7. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he ruled for 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the Lord's eyes. And he walked in the ways of his ancestor David, not deviating from it even a bit to the right or left. In the eighth year of his rule, while he was just a boy, he began to seek the God of his ancestor David. And in the twelfth year, he began purifying Judah and Jerusalem of the shrines, the sacred poles, idols, and images. Under his supervision, the altars of the balls were torn down, and the incest altars that were above them were smashed. He broke up the sacred poles, idols, and images, grinding them to dust 
and scattering them over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars, purifying Judah and Jerusalem. In the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, all the way up to Nephetali, he removed their temples, tore down the altars and sacred poles, ground the idols to dust, and smashed all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. Then Josiah returned to Jerusalem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Ryan. Now, our New Testament lesson comes to us from the great book of Philippians. Um, this is a letter that Paul writes to a beloved church, a church that he gave birth to, and as he went over into Macedonia, you may remember the occasion as it's recorded in the book of the Acts, where Paul had every desire to want to go up into the northern reaches of Asia Minor. And then in a dream, there is a vision. And said, hey, come on over to Macedonia. We need you over here. And so Paul said, okay. Because he tried to get up into the northern reaches of Asia Minor on the south shore of the Black Sea. But it just wasn't happening. And he just couldn't get in. But then this dream happened and he goes over to Macedonia. And there, who's he run into? But Lydia, right, who is from Philippi. And she opens up her home and it becomes the first church in Philippi, an amazing gathering of people who encountered the gospel there in that spot of the Roman Empire. Wow! God does amazing things. Now, in the midst of this, right, Paul hears word that things are kind of going sideways in that little nascent church. And we come to this chapter in chapter 3, right, and we're going to encounter some, <laughs> some. Uh, I, I guess the best way to describe it is Paul's heart just breaking and a little bit irritated by what has happened to this little infant church because of some knuckleheads around the periphery of the church. So just to set the stage for you right there, let's attend uh, God's word and seek to hear what it is that the Spirit is revealing to us today. This is Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 11. You can certainly follow along if you brought your Bible, or if you have your phone with a Bible app on it. Just uh, call it right up. Here we go. Hear now God's truth. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, i got more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, I persecuted the church, as to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is God's truth. Let's spend some time praying. 
Oh, Lord God Almighty, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to gather on this auspicious day of World Communion Sunday to encounter your truth here in this space in the outdoor wonder of your glorious world. Merciful Savior, we do come humbly before you, seeking that your spirit would so inspire us at this time that the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts would be made acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we hear a lot about this coronavirus and everything that's going on there, and it just keeps to be on uh, like a regular drone, right, in the background, the coronavirus, coronavirus, COVID-19, lockdown, mitigation, social distance, all this stuff, and it's this giant sucking sound that comes out, it just feels like it's draining us of all joy and hope and, and aspirations to be together. It's like, oh, still more news like this? Ah, oh, I don't know how much longer we can endure this. Well, I want to look at something positive that's happening because of coronavirus. You know, there's, there's something that is that has been taking place, and I believe 95% of the homes across the United States and quite possibly around the world. And it's a positive thing, you know, because because of this disease, how many of us have like clambered up into the attic or crawled around through the basement or opened up cabinet doors or bureaus and said, why do I have this? <laughs> and you're just cleaning out stuff, you know, you're just purging, you're just... Okay, this has got to go. You know, you're just going around. Maybe you picked up a sledgehammer. I don't know. You're busting down walls. There's things that we've been doing during this corona lockdown that has happened or this uh, time of not being able to be engaged in the activities that we typically would do. And we've focused our energies on cleaning out stuff, right? Things that have accumulated over time. <sighs> it's kind of enjoyable in some ways but it's really hard at the same time i mean it's super hard because once you pull down that box and you open it up and you see that girl scout sash and you go oh my gosh i can't throw this away this is it'd be like sacrilege because it's it's part of my identity it's who I am. It's like I'm, I'm throwing a piece of my life away or something. So you start going through this stuff and you start, oh, no, oh, this, this award I got for playing soccer when I was four years old, this trophy. Oh, I can't. No, oh, I got to keep that. You know, <laughs> you just start looking at this stuff, right? And all that you have accumulated, and it gets, it's hard because it is a part of who you were. Right? So you have your identity wrapped up in these things. And boy, is that tough. It's tough. And Paul is writing to the church of Philippi because the people of that church are getting wrapped up into identity with things. There's been a group of people who have come into the church insidiously in some ways to poison the waters of that nascent church. This group of people who have come with a heretical philosophy and expression of religious uh, belief and exercise that has kind of distorted what it is that really is to be known about a relationship with Jesus Christ. They've started to we place upon that nascent church these expectations of what they need to do and how they have to be if they want to claim any kind of identity as a Christian. Wow. And Paul gets word of this. And boy, he is not happy at all. Matter of fact, it just stirs up his ire so much so that he uses a a, a literary form, right, that is part of his own background, his nurturing, his training, to be able to underscore and emphasize how awful this is. 
if we look at the prophet Isaiah, right, and we see how Isaiah captures the words of the angels as they speak of God's holiness, what do they say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is emphatic. It's to be able to tell us God is holy, and there's nothing else more holy than God. When Jesus says to his disciples, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, that's like putting an underline. Listen up, folks. Sit up and take notice of this. And Paul uses that same kind of literary technique right here to be able to underscore and make sure that his audience understands when he says, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evildoers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. Are those three different groups that he's talking about? No. It's the same group of people being emphatically recognized in three different ways. That these individuals who are distorting their pursuit of righteousness before the presence of a holy God are causing havoc. You need to watch out. And I mean it. Watch out. This is what Paul is doing. He's making it clear to his readers that there is something definitely not good. You know, and as we read, even as he writes to the people of Galatia, which is right close, you know, near by there in Asia Minor, he identifies this group of people and he says, man, who has bewitched you? Oh, Galatians. And so likewise, he is kind of recognizing how it's happening to these people in Philippi. And the people who have bewitched them, right, are a group of individuals known as the Judaizers. And these Judaizers have placed a huge emphasis upon circumcision and the, and the fulfillment of the law and to do all these things that were part of the old covenant to say you have to live into these things if you say that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. This brought about a huge tension, so much so that if we read through the book of Acts, we see when Paul comes to the Jerusalem council, and what does he have to do? He has to defend these Gentile believers. Because the Jerusalem council was saying, no, they have to do X, Y, and Z if they want to be in this. And, and Paul's like, no. But the Judaizers... We're poisoning the waters of faith with these expectations of things. And it's amazing because as Paul goes forward in this little portion of Scripture that we're looking at, you would think that he starts to become boasting about who he is. He's not boasting at all because he's writing to people that he dearly loves. He cares for these people so much and they know who he is because he spent time with them in Philippi. And he writes to them and he says, let me tell you something. When I came and shared the gospel with you, and I had all this history of being part of the, the full Jewish leadership, did I at any time tell you that you have to do all these things? In essence, he's saying, of course I didn't. He said, listen. You know, these people are coming in and saying, you need to do X, Y, and Z to be able to, to be a, a faithful Christian or follower of Jesus. And Paul says, wait a minute. I was circumcised on the eighth day. My mom and dad took me to the temple and had me circumcised on the eighth day. Some of these Judaizers, they can't say that. Some of these guys just got circumcised maybe three weeks ago. Maybe they were 23 years old when they got circumcised because they thought that this was an important thing to do. Well, I've got them in spades. I was there circumcised on the eighth day. If you want to follow the law, I was following the law because my parents were following the law. Now, let's talk about following the law. I was a Pharisee, for Pete's sake. I'm telling you what, as, as to somebody who obeyed the law, man, I was blameless. And he starts going on and on. And he says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. You want to talk about having some lineage and national identity and ethnic value for who I was and what that importance is that all these Judaizers are saying, that, hey, no, I've got this. I'm Jewish and you're not, but that makes me better. Blah, blah, blah. Paul goes on and says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. You can't beat that. The first king of Israel came out of tribe of Benjamin. Did I put any value in any of this stuff? He's basically saying to the 
church of Philippi when I talked to you about Jesus? He said, not at all. Not at all. He said, these dogs are misleading you. They are distracting you from what it means to live a life of faith. He says, and let me tell you something. All that stuff that I have as part of my identity or my past, he said, I count it as refuge, as trash, as that which goes into the garbage heap. And actually, if you do the real translation of this word, it gets a little bit more graphic. Because he's talking about the dogs, which isn't a term of endearment. And he says, all this stuff is the stuff that you would step in when you're mowing the lawn. It's excrement. It's dog poop, is what he's basically saying. So what these dogs are telling you to do, it's actually poop. I count it as that kind of stuff. It's of no value. Wow. This is how upset Paul is about what is happening to the church being polluted by false heretical teaching. It's absolutely got him fired up. Because our identity is not in the things that we're capable of doing or what we have done or what our national heritage is or our ethnic you know, privilege is. It's none of that. Paul counts that all as nothing compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. It's the faith that God has given to us to recognize who we are before Jesus that really matters. You know, I coupled with this the story of Josiah. And I want to tell you this because it helps us to put into perspective what it is that maybe we have allowed ourselves to accumulate certain things that are a distraction to our walk with Jesus. So imagine you're Josiah, and rightly so, Ryan said to the kids, think about it, you're eight years old. Who's eight years old right here? Raise your hand. Anybody close to eight? Yeah, all right, Zach, you're eight. King Zach. That's awesome. What else? Anybody else close to eight or seven, maybe nine years old? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Gwendolyn. Fantastic. Queen Gwendolyn. All hail Queen Gwendolyn. You know, this is amazing stuff. Think about this. You become a king or a queen at eight years old. Now, your history and your identity that brings you into that position, right? You're going to use that as a reference point to understand how is it I'm going to live into this role. You're going to have advisors that are coming to you, religious advisors and priests saying, Oh, king, you will need to make sure that the Asherah pole is still being honored and you'll need to make your offering up to the Asherah pole. Oh, king, you know, Baal needs this and blah, 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 blah. And all these people are going to come and try to influence you because you're just a mere eight years old and you may not know much of what needs to happen. How did you become king or queen at eight years old anyway? Well, you got to look at his history and what he's been nurtured in. So his dad, right? How is it that his dad lived? His dad was very much steeped into the pagan practices of the day and the surrounding nations. This was his identity. This was his history. This was his, you know, little buckaroo card that he had. And his dad was so steeped in evil and doing that which was dishonorable before the presence of God that his own staff rose up and killed him. That's why Josiah had to rise to the throne at eight years old. Because his dad was murdered. Now you think, okay, what about Josiah's grandpa? Well, he was no shining star either. His grandpa, who established the patterns as well, was equally even worse. He was so bad that he took his own firstborn son and put him on the arms of the steaming hot bail and allowed that little baby infant to roll into the mouth of Baal as a human sacrifice. 
This is what Josiah grew up in. This is what he knew. This was part of his experience. This is his identity of sorts. This is how we live into a religious devotion, right? When he turns 16, many of us have come to a relationship with Jesus when we were teenagers, whether we went on a camping experience or it's our youth group or whatever it is. It's right then, you know, we're at this point in life and you talk to anyone who does youth ministry, they'll say, yeah, that's a prime time spot for encountering the gospel. How many of us, if we look out in the crowd, really began to take seriously our encounter with Jesus? Even if we were nurtured in the church, it probably really began to click and stick for us when we were teenagers. And so likewise for King Josiah. He's 16 years old and he has an encounter with God. And God calls him into a deeper understanding of who he is. Not just who his Josiah, but who God is. Right? And so, by the time he turns 20, he's like, no, no, no. And he looks the priests in the eye, of priests of Asherah, where people are going up and having sexual orgies to try and manipulate the gods for their own specific blessing of harvest pleasure or having children or whatever it is and he looks at them and says no this is no longer going to be the case and he shuts it all down he destroys the asherah poles he destroys the altars he crushes them into dust treats them as what trash refuge even excrement something that goes underfoot and grinds it down including the bones of the priests who were promoting this heretical understanding of what it is that we should be doing as a people to worship. It was so contrary to the message of what God had given to the nation of Israel. Wow. That's some serious, you know, attribution of Josiah to live into an identity that he recognized that none of that stuff matters. But what really matters is how am I living in the presence of a holy God? Fully devoted to him. Let me tell you about another king. This king was steeped in paganism. That's all he knew. And then he encountered the truth of the gospel. And when he encountered the truth of the gospel, he made a declaration. He made a declaration that the Roman Empire is now the Holy Roman Empire. Wow! And you would think at that point, that's great! You know, here comes this king who comes, or emperor actually, who says, whoa, yeah, the church is the place! And and persecution's over! This is awesome! There's great joy across the land because of this reality that now the church has free reign to live and express its truth because the emperor says, this is the religion of the land. Hmm. There's trouble in that as well. Even as we see how the trouble was present in the first century with the Judaizers. Because under Constantine, you see, and if you look and become a student of church history, what happened? What happened? It didn't take long at all. Matter of fact, it took maybe a couple of years before the church was already expressing this tension because there were some who were saying, no, that can't be the case, and others saying, this is the case, and it split. And then you had bishops of Rome getting up against the bishop of Avignon, getting up against the bishop of of Constantinople, and they were all expressing who has the most authority, who has the most power, how is it supposed to be done, where is it that we're supposed to do, what is the things that we have to observe, how is it that we go about, you know, expressing our religious conviction, all this garbage was being promoted within the life of the church and all under the guise of, yes, we are a Christian nation. 
Gordon Fee, who is an amazing New Testament scholar, puts it this way. Buckle your seatbelts. Confusion of being Christian with being a member of a given nation has a long history in the church. It is one of the pernicious bequests of the conversion of Constantine, which plagues not only official Christian states, but more insidiously a country like the United States. Oh. What does that mean for us? How do we understand what is our identity? So many people want to say, well, the United States is a Christian nation. Well, I, <laughs> tap the brakes. Tap the brakes. We are celebrating World Communion Sunday today. Our identity is in Christ. We happen to live in the United States. Let's keep the priorities straight. There are brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world in which we share a common identity with them. Because of who Jesus is, boundaries and national barriers are erased. This is what's most important. As we look at our United States, yes, there are values that we want to espouse. But ultimately, we are not a Christian nation. The founding fathers and mothers didn't even want it to be that way. Why is it that they left England in the first place? Because King George and the established religious order of the Church of England was oppressing them from being able to experience right relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. It was polluted, it was perverted, it was distorted. And so they came to the U.S. so that we could, they could, worship God without the all the attachments and all the expectations and all the other things that was distorting the essence of what it was to have a pure relationship with Jesus Christ. Thus our amendment is stated as it is. And what does that mean for us as the church? Any time that the state begins to declare this is what the church is, this is what the religion of the land is, then we've lost our prophetic voice. We as the church have a prophetic voice and at any time we align ourselves with any party, with any governmental structure, we lose our capacity to call into account those who have been placed in the positions of authority as government authority figures in our land. We have a responsibility. And we need to do that. The church cannot lose its ability to speak truth to power. This is what Paul is telling the church of Philippi. Your identity is in Christ. Not in these things. Not in what these expectations are that are being placed upon you to say this is how you are to live your life. In accordance to these temporal things, we live in accordance to the gospel message that Christ alone is whom we serve. This is important for us. We come to this table here. It is not an ethnic table. It is not a national table. It is not a table of certain religious expectations or religious practices. It is not a table of hierarchy that some people are better than another. We come to this table, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, equal before the presence of a holy God who loves us and who has given us the ability to live by faith. And our righteousness is a reflection of that faith. We count all other things as that which we step in as we're raking the leaves or mowing the lawn in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. Wow! So we come to this table, my friends, with a great deal of gratitude and humility for what Christ has done for us 
and who we are together as a body of believers. Let us come into the presence of a holy God in prayer. Merciful Savior, Lord of all grace and hope, we thank you so much for this glorious day, even as we have been challenged by your truth and as we reflect upon those things that we have in our lives that keep us from being able to worship you without any encumbrance. Lord, who is it in our lives that is dist distorting what it is that we need to embrace? Help us to identify that so that we can properly identify with you. Merciful Savior, Lord of all creation, you are the one in whom we trust. And our lives are dependent upon you. Equip us to be like Josiah. Help us to recognize that those things that need to be ground into the dust. Help us to know how it is that we speak truth to power how it is that we live in utter dependence in your truth so that we may be seen as one worthy to suffer even as you suffer. As ones who are empty even as you emptied yourself. As ones who will attain the resurrection even as you have proven yourself victorious over the grave. We give you thanks, Lord God, for the life that you have bestowed upon us. Equip us to embrace the day for your name's sake, for we are your child. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So we come to this table in recognition that this table is the table of our Lord. And all who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are welcome to this table. Those who would not profess Jesus Christ, why would they come in the first place? But those who do come, we acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sakes, who gave of himself so that we might have life. And the exciting part to that is that people will come from east and west, from north and south, and they'll come and they'll gather around this table acknowledging the fact that Christ has died to give us life, to restore the brokenness of that relationship that happened long ago, and it could never be restored by anything that we would do. We would all woefully fall short, and it gets distorted in our attempts anyway. So Christ comes as the pure and spotless Lamb, offers himself up as the sacrifice so that we may be able to have perfect communion with the one who called us into existence. We come to this table. Would you pray with me? Loving Father God, we thank you for this day, this chance to be worshiping with our sisters and brothers who are gathered here, but this reality that as we are having this communion meal, that we have sisters and brothers in Christ around the world who are also celebrating this meal. And so we thank you for that unity that we have through this meal with not only those believers around the world who are currently living, but the ones that came before us and the ones that will come after us. For God, you have been faithful throughout history to us, and for that we give you thanks. We think of Adam and Eve, and they ate of that fruit as they weren't supposed to, and, and there was consequences, and so they got kicked out of the garden. But even in that, you provided them clothing. And then as we go through history, you've sent prophets who tried to call kings and the kingdoms back into right living. And they told of a Messiah that was going to come one day that would set all things right. And then you sent your son Jesus to be born as a babe in Bethlehem. And as he grew and we got to learn of his life, we got to see what love looked like in flesh, who you were. 
we got to see the miracles that he did, and we also got to see how he welcomed the leper in and healed him. God, we thank you for all that you have done for us and the mercy that you keep bestowing. God, we thank you that as you're in that upper room with your disciples, where you knew you were going to be heading to that cross to die for our sins, you gave them this meal. God, so we ask that you would take now this ordinary bread and this ordinary juice, and that you would set them aside through your Holy Spirit that's present with us now for your extraordinary purposes, that we might be fed physically and spiritually. And God, we thank you on this World Communion Sunday that you also gave us a prayer that unites us together, that you taught your disciples. And so we say that prayer now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On that night when Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread. Yeah, this is a thing. No question. It's a thing that's there, and the danger is that we can hold this thing up in a certain kind of misdirected reverence, I think, in some ways. Why is this here? What is the purpose behind this journey to the table? There are items that you probably pulled out of the attic or maybe out of the basement that serve as mementos, and serve as certain reminders of what you had done or who you are as an individual and family. I'm not saying that those things don't have value. It's a matter of have those things ascended to a position that they become idols and they supersede what is most important. You see, the bread that Jesus took was the bread of the Passover. And there was a certain way that you were supposed to go through the liturgy of the Passover. As he took that matzah bread, there were certain things that he had to do that were expected as part of the religious rite. But Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. That's not in the liturgy. Jesus was making it very clear that there's something more important in your identity than being somebody who is a Jew that remembers the great work of God who brought you out of the captivity of Israel, out of Egypt. And so likewise now, for us today, there's something far greater for us to remember. And whether or not we use a certain kind of bread, or whether or not we're actually eating from the common loaf as you've taken this little, you know, individual serving of the communion. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The thing that matters is that you have an identity with Christ and you're about to partake of something that serves as a reminder of what Christ, what Christ has done on the cross for us as the people of God. And this bread is a visual reminder of that. And that little piece of matzah bread or of short bread that you have in your cup equally serves as that reminder. We are one in Christ, not because we eat from a common loaf, but because we understand that our identity is rooted in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.
quick aside, if you came in and you didn't get your own individual element, there are people from the worship committee. So if you raise your hand, they'll, they'll come to you now. So as they were sitting around that table, he picked up the Elijah cup, which they would have expected him to do. That was part of the, the whole meal. But then he again broke tradition as he said, this cup represents a new covenant. He'd been talking about covenant, but he says a new covenant. So their ears are listening. And he says, which is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. And so as we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord and Savior until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Friends, the bread of heaven just come down and broken for you. Take and eat. This is the cup of salvation, representing the new covenant shed in Jesus' blood for the remission of your sins. Drink ye all of it. Let us join together now in our prayer after communion. The words are in your bulletin. Loving God, we thank, we thank you, you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, friends, what a great joy it is for us to gather and worship here in this space and to recognize that, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, and to remember that refrain as we go out into the world, as we share the truth with those who are seeking to understand what is truth, for those who have got a mixed-up identity, and what does it mean to understand who am I in this world? We have a gift. And we get to go bear witness to that gift. We have been strengthened by an amazing meal that Christ has prepared for us. That stands as a marker for all the world. That claims we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, with all those across the globe, we have an identity that reveals hope and truth. Go out into the world, my friends, radiating that good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen.